I sometimes I say like wouldn't if we could approach every moment of our life with compassion and curiosity like that really would change the world. Welcome to Shineable, the podcast with insights and inspiration to live your best life. My guest today has a big dream to make mindfulness part of our everyday education system. Kim Armstrong co-founded the nonprofit called Space Between in Seattle to start bringing this big dream to life. In today's podcast, Kim shares how it all got started and some really fun stories from the kids and some information about how her program is already having a big impact in schools. Welcome to Shineable. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Kim. I want to introduce Kim Armstrong to our listeners and viewers Hi. with Space Between. <laughs> I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here too. Yeah. So tell us, what is your organization? Tell us about Space Between. Yeah, so Space Between is a nonprofit uh, based in Seattle, and we uh, work on bringing mindfulness practices to schools, and that includes students, teachers and staff, and then also families. Excellent. So mindfulness practices. Mindfulness, that's a big word, right? Everybody's talking about mindfulness now, mental health. Why don't you tell people what mindfulness means to you? Yeah, so the definition that we use at Space Between is the practice of being in the present moment with compassion and curiosity. Uh, we combine two definitions, um, Ruth King and then Dr. Christopher Willard, and um, and then there are parentheses behind that, so you can choose what to do next. So just that by pausing and practicing and being aware of the present moment, we have a little bit more space between all the things that are happening out in the world and kind of how we respond. Because we have more awareness, we have more compassion, we have more curiosity rather than judgment. And so over time, we have more space between. I love that. <laughs> I was wondering how that name came about. Yeah, so I mean, we were thinking about a lot of different things, right? The space between our ears, the space between our thoughts, the space between all the things that happen. And then there's also a Viktor Frankl quote. Viktor Frankl wrote, wrote Man's Search for Meaning. Um, he was a, a psychologist and a Holocaust survivor. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, he his quote says, um, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space lies our power to choose. And mm. in our power to choose is our growth and our freedom. Or something very similar to that, right? So this is the idea about creating more space. I so, love that. Yeah. That's amazing. So yeah. I know you had an idea of doing a, a little mindfulness exercise. Yeah, maybe we could just do a quick practice. Let's do it. Okay. And our okay. viewers and listeners, yeah. you can do it too. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we often start, especially for people that are new to mindfulness, is using our senses. Because our senses are always in this moment rather than our mind, which can be past, oh, yeah. future, whatever. <laughs> but our senses are always here. Um, so we'll do one and we'll just use a couple of our senses. So you could close your eyes if you like. Okay. Or you could look down. It's kind of your choice. And then we'll just first tune into our sense of hearing and just noticing any sounds we hear in this space we're in right now. Bringing in those elements of curiosity and compassion. And then turning your attention to your breath without changing the way you're breathing, simply noticing the feeling of your breath moving in and out of your body. Perhaps you notice kind of where you feel it the most, maybe the temperature, the sensation. And then turn your attention simply to noticing what it feels like being held by the chair, kind of your bottom in the seat. Notice the sensation of the air in the room on your skin. And then let your attention go to either sound or breath or a sensation in your body. And we'll just rest there for like 15 seconds. If your mind wanders to all the things, just come back to the one you chose. And now let's take a slow breath in through our nose. Release it out through your nose or your mouth. And then if your eyes are closed, gently flutter them open. Maybe you should let your eyes rest on something just a few feet away just to orient you back to the space. I see some flowers, some yellow flowers. 
Yeah, so that's just an example of a mindfulness practice. Oh, I love it. And is that an example of something you would do in the schools with the kids? Yeah, I mean, a little bit more playful often with the kids. That was more of a, an adult oriented. We would definitely do that with adults. Yeah, yeah. And we do something similar with kids, but just with a little bit more play and often we'll, we'll, a little more movement. We might have them move, rock from side to side and notice and things like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah but we always do. We start all of our classroom lessons off with listening to a bell. Mm. Um, so like practicing listening and then we always do some sort of breath practice and a lot of the ones that we do with kids are very um, Especially the younger ones very kind of Imaginative and creative and then they also create their own practices, which is really cool. Oh, that is cool. Yeah Yeah, yeah. well there was a, um, a kindergartner uh, like a month ago who made up unicorn breath Oh really? Yeah. How does so unicorn you, you breathe though? in, and you bring your uh, arms up here like the horn of a unicorn, and then you breathe out, kind of down like that. And I was thinking it was like breathe in the unicorn horn, breathe out. She didn't say this, but it's like a rainbow going. Yeah. Down. I yeah. love that. Yeah. Yeah. Unicorn breath. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean that's just one of so many that the <laughs> kids come up with. It just there was another little girl that did. Um, she loves octopi, and she did octopus breath where you have your five and they put your three on top and then the octopus would come up and then come down. Ooh, that's breathe in, pretty. Breathe out. Yeah, it's, 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 the kids are amazing and that's like a big part of actually what we're doing is trying to get some like leadership and ownership so anybody can lead a, at least a breath practice with other people. That is wonderful. Yeah. 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 So and, and and is the response, is it does it take some time for them to get, you know, into it, or is it just immediate? They, they enjoy it and they're engaged. Uh, it depends on the classroom and it depends on the students. I wouldn't say that the, you know, the first day we have every student, you know, engaged. Um, but sometimes it depends on on kind of what what the, the community that they've already built in their classroom. Yeah. So. Um, by the end, I mean, we just have been going through our evaluations and kids have been writing thank you notes and stuff. And I'd say by the end, I mean, most of our results from the years are like 90 and 95% of the students have like found a practice that works for them and have found at least one positive thing that's changed, whether they feel like they're less worried or they're less angry or they're, they're kinder or whatever it is. I mean, we hear things like mindfulness helped me not punch my brother. <laughs> Um, thank you for helping with me with my panic attacks. Mindfulness has helped me be calm and kinder. I mean, uh, every kid is a little different in terms of the benefits that they find, but um, yeah. It's, That's it's, amazing. It, it feels good to see the impact. Yeah. Yeah. So um, how long have you been doing this? You know, tell me how it started. How did you get into mindfulness and what was the inspiration for you to start the organization? Yeah, yeah. So I started practicing mindfulness in the form of yoga um, when I was pregnant with my daughter. She's 22 now. So when I was doing prenatal yoga, so that was like my first entry into it. And then just like it kind of grew over the years. Um, so Easter Twin has been around. We, the idea for it came about in May of seven years ago. Okay. So um, I had been previously working for another nonprofit called Washington Green Schools, which is now called Earth Gen and working with students and schools and teachers on kind of um, using the school as a like a environmental laboratory and thinking about action projects that students could take whether it was like starting a composting program or building a garden or um, educating people about turning off lights and um, energy use and things like that and we kind of had a, a family um, Health, some family health issues at that time and I had to take a leave of absence and I decided not to go back and just started thinking about like what 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 is helpful for young people being well and I decided to go back to school um, to do my master's in psychology I, I got certified to teach yoga and meditation and did courses with mindful schools and during that time period I met a, a woman who was the owner of a yoga studio Michael Spruins and she had been a teacher and she was coming at it from the perspective of like I am I am I do my best teaching when I'm practicing when I'm meditating when I'm practicing mindfulness I was coming at it from the from the kind of like what could we do to help students be more well and whole like early on can we give these tools that I have found like transformational for me 
uh, can we give them to them at a younger age? And so the two of us had been thinking the same thing and you know, one day had a conversation and uh, it was kind of amazing. They were like, oh, we have the same idea. And so like, the idea was to think about a school community and focus on the teachers and staff, their own wellness, their own awareness, their own curiosity and compassion, the students as well. And then um, we do a little bit of family programming too, so we're kind of like all the stakeholders in the school are um, receiving some instruction. Fantastic. Yeah. Because, and I, um, I love that because, you know, it, it's true, the teachers are so important. And if, especially if you're helping kids learn something new with mindfulness, you know, you want the teachers to also be part of that experience, have their own experience, and then they can take it forward because you're not there every day. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, we do lessons once a week and then um, we're kind of doing some coaching and communication and providing practices for the teachers and asking them to continue on, like, the practice. You know, like, let's say we taught balloon breathing or something like that or mindful listening. We'd ask the, the teachers to try to build that in once or more times a day. We use rhythm and repetition. Can you just build it into your practice and your routines just like other routines that you would have in your classroom anyway? Yeah, so it becomes part of the culture and the kind of way of being in the school. I love when it. We're not there. Which um, school are you targeting? Elementary or which we age group? We mostly work in elementary schools because they have time built into their schedules for social emotional learning. It's a little harder in middle schools and high schools, although I think it's just as needed for us. Uh, we have done a little bit in some middle schools and some high schools, but um, it's just a little bit more difficult because that you know they have their classes that they need to take and they don't have like as much freedom so mm -hmm. any but, yeah oh any like sports teams or or you know drama clubs or anything like that yeah. we have done some of that and um but most of our work is focused on the you know during the school day but we have done, like we've done some some stuff with swim teams and we actually have been asked a few times to do some things with soccer teams and things like that so and we do some after school um with the Boys and Girls Club and the oh, YMCA, great. and we've done some of that too, like mindful movement classes and things like that. Nice. So, yeah. That is so wonderful. So did yeah. you have to take a pause during the pandemic, or how did, you know, what happened during the pandemic time? Yeah, um, good question. <laughs> we So the, the first few months of the, uh, when everybody was still figuring things out, when everything got shut down, we, um, you know, we couldn't go into schools and, and people didn't have devices, so we ended up offering three times a week for adults, so for teachers and staff and parents and guardians, uh, a mindfulness practice, and then three times a week we offered one that was kid-focused, um, just via Facebook Live. And so we had, and, and we actually had a lot of, you know, both, you know, teachers and staff and family members that were saying that, like, that was, like, life-saving, kind of. I mean, that's too strong of a word, but it was, like, super supportive for them um, during that time. So that's what we did for that short period of time, and then, um, and then we taught online, so we would go visit a classroom via Microsoft Teams or, um, or Zoom. Um, just like we would visit a classroom in person, we just visited the classroom online. And, you know, we spent a lot of time, like, kind of adapting our curriculum and thinking about ways that we could um, make it accessible online. And um, we got really great feedback. And, um, and then, you know, and then we had a year of... Uh, you know, not this past school, but the school year before, where things were like a little bit more back to normal, and then this year much more so. Yeah. yeah. So you're coming up to the end of the school year, correct? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then, so during summer, what happens? Is there just a break? Uh, it's a little slower. Um, we do some workshops. Um, we have some summer camps. Um, we're doing, um, you know, workshops with other organizations like the Seattle Art Museum and schools at Washington and things like that. And then typically towards the latter part of August, we start working in schools again. So like doing some of their professional learning and then um, some of the stuff for, for the students as well. Okay. So, yeah. Sounds amazing. Yeah. I yeah. want to go to mindfulness camp with you. <laughs> that sounds fun <laughs> at the art museum. That would be That's amazing. for educators. Yeah. 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 Oh my goodness. So yeah. how many teachers, how many mindfulness teacher instructors would you have out in the schools? Is it just you, a small team, or do you have a whole bunch? Yeah, we have, um, 
we have four uh, at, the, at the moment, our model is we have four co-directors, three of whom teach in the schools in addition to doing other kind of jobs in the organization, and then we have a few contractors. We're actually hiring right now for some additional people. Okay. Um, but we have some contractors that are going out into the schools. We're like a pretty lean team. Um, we do a lot with what we have. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. sounds like it. Yeah. It sounds, and what a big impact. Would would you say, like, do you have stories of the biggest impact? I know you shared some some of the feedback from the kids. What yeah. else have you heard? Yeah, so, um, we, so we measure, you know, every year kind of both those stories about, like, how kids have been affected, but then also things like, you know, um, you know, what percentage of um, students had found a practice that was helpful and things like that. And then... Uh, an, another thing that we've been looking at is in the schools where we've been for a few years, we've been looking at this climate survey data through Seattle Public Schools where they look at different measures and students' perception of things. And mm -hmm. um, in the schools where we've been for a while, there's three kind of indicators where we feel like we have made an, not, knowing we're not the only thing, but there's a correlation. Um, and those are a feeling of belonging, a feeling of safety, and um, social emotional learning. And in those schools where we've been for a period of time, they, the average score went up like 20 percentage points, like from wow. the 60s until the 80s. Um, some of our other schools, and this is kind of different with every school in terms of how they measure, like they've noticed re um, reductions, significant reductions in, in um, students being referred to the office for behavioral things or, you know, discipline data and things like that. So, um, wow. so aside from just like the feel good stories of, you know, students saying, you know, this has helped me so much or teachers saying like, wow, we had one teacher that said like, I think a 30 year veteran teacher, this is the first thing that has ever really worked to help oh, wow. me and my students. Amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. I yeah. love that. Yeah. So you're seeing like a huge impact locally. What's your big dream with your with space between? What would you love to see happen? I think, I mean, this is a long t term dream, but I, I think that if mindfulness was just part of our education system, I think that, I mean, that would be a dream. And there are other organizations in the country that are also working on that. We're part of like a national coalition of like sharing best practices and kind of supporting each other. But um, what's the national coalition called? We don't have a name. No, just okay. a coalition. No, I don't know. We don't have a name. Okay, yeah. no it's just If other, we find it's it, other, we'll add it to the show. Yeah, notes. there's yeah. Other, <laughs> other, other organizations that are doing mindfulness in schools or with youth. Yeah, okay. and, and, and yeah, I think that our calendar name has something like that, but I can't remember what it's called. But anyway, okay. no worries. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. So I love that. I love that big dream. And, you know, think of the impact and you're making such a huge impact with each student, with each teacher, with each class. And then that just amplifies and grows. Could be amazing. I, I think, you know, so many of the issues that we have as adults, as teenagers, with anxiety, with mental health, with mental health um, if we can create from a young age just a totally different almost outlook, right? Yeah. And way of being, that would be so beautiful. Yeah. And you're doing it. Yeah, I we are doing it as a team <laughs> and, and, and like in partnership with the with the teachers and the schools and the students. So, yeah. Yeah. We are. And it feels good to be doing it. And I sometimes I say like wouldn't if we could approach every moment of our life with compassion and curiosity, like that really would change the world. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. So, um before, I know we're, we're getting a little close on time. What else, is there anything else you'd like to share with our viewers and listeners? Um, is there anything else I'd like to share? Um, it's a team effort. Um, we have an amazing board and, uh, and other folks and, you know, just relationships with the schools. Um, uh, we're always looking for kind of just building out that network, building out connections into new schools, into other organizations that are supporting youth. Um, we are always looking for funding because we're a nonprofit and school budgets have been cut this year, which people might know about. Um, yeah. So I think that's it. And yeah. Okay. Yeah, so sign up for our newsletter. So, okay. Oh, great. You have yeah. a newsletter. So yeah. how, how do people contact you? 
You have a website, yeah, social media? Yeah, we have media. a website. Um, our website address is um, spacebetween.community. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then you can email just like our um, direct email is info at spacebetween.community. Okay. And then we have an Instagram uh, and we have a Facebook and we have a YouTube channel so you can find us in all of those places as well and the YouTube channel is actually great because there are uh, practices that students have created there there's also practices for adults and then there's also some just like information and, and um, you know kind of about our work um, we were recently featured on um, Seattle Public Ch uh, Schools news channel like their student-led newscast called oh. First Bell, and there's a little story about one of our schools, Sanislo Elementary, uh, which is really cool because the students are the reporters and telling the story a little bit about mindfulness in the school, which is kind of cool. That's on our YouTube channel. So. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah we'll share a link okay. to that. That yeah. sounds good. Cool. So donations, joining up for your newsletter, uh, offering to help spread the word, volunteering. Yeah. Uh, if you know some mindfulness instructors, you know, you're hiring. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's all find that. that. <laughs> okay, wonderful. <laughs> wonderful, yeah. Kim, thank you so much. This yeah. has been fascinating. I love the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank and you. Um, it's a really great dream and just keep going. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. See you next time for another episode of Shinable. And remember, the world's a better place when you show up and shine.